Thank you very much. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here uh, today, and um, thank you to Sean and all of the team from from Knots for you know all of the behind the work scenes that goes into a busy couple of days like like we're uh, going to have the next few days. I must be honest, I'm also really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be uh, really some really fruitful discussions. So pleasure to be here and to open the conference and to see you all here. And uh, uh, I look forward to, to chatting to you all in some of the breaks. Um, I always prepare far too many slides. And um, now I, I've, I'm going to get my five minute warning. So I really must dive straight into it because there's quite a lot of ground that I, I really want to cover. And uh, so, okay, what is biological farming? And I have to say that uh, I'm answering this question, I'm going to discuss this topic from my perspective. Uh, I've kind of really just put my opinion in from you know, the work that I've done, uh, the reading, the research that I do, all of my own experiences. I've kind of put together some kind of points and some, some strategies, and I've, I've kind of put together a list of 10 things, kind of 10, 10 key ideas uh, that we can apply, that we can utilize uh, to, um, you know, working towards healthy soils kind of from a, a biological perspective. So straight into it, uh, it starts for me like this. Uh, here we have, we, we certainly sit right now in, in a paradigm transition. I think we're in the middle of this uh, transition from you know, an old way of looking at soils into a, a newer way of looking at soils, or perhaps a bit more of a, a more complete way of looking at soils. And it starts with the old paradigm. You know, here we were, it was this idea that, well, plants, they release these organic acids, these hydrogen ions and acids that directly solubilize minerals from the soil. They strip those minerals from the soil and make the, release those from the soil and, and, you know, make those available back to the plant. And we knew we had this, you know, my little red friend over here. Wow, we knew there was some life there, but we didn't really fully understand quite how to manage or to measure that or because it's very big, very vast and very diverse. It's a very complex ecosystem. It's not so easy to study. We didn't have the tools. So we kind of knew it was there, but we had this very chemical kind of focused um, view of how plants obtain nutrients from the soil. And in reality, there's also this other side of the equation. Well, they also, plants release sugars, carbohydrates, all sorts of other root exudates that don't necessarily directly solubilize nutrients from the soil, but certainly feed the microorganisms around that root system. And indirectly, they also help to cycle those nutrients. They release their own acids and things. And they do, of course, help to release those minerals from the soil uh, for plant uptake and driving that nutrient cycling. So if I can just return back to this one for a minute, but there was also a slight little flaw with even thinking it's so simplistic, so kind of mechanistic in this view of organic acids solubilizing minerals, which is that, well, of course, the root systems are absolutely covered in billions and billions of microorganisms, of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, etc. And so even these organic acids that do come out, well, there's also all these organisms there who gobble up those and feed on those and intercept those. I mean, root exudates, how long do they even live in the soil? They're exuded by the plant, but they're very rapidly consumed by organisms. They only migrate one millimeter, two millimeters away from the root uh, before they're intercepted and consumed by uh, the life in the soil. So really, a much more complete way of looking at soils perhaps would be something more along the lines of this. And so this is the paradigm transition. Now we are beginning this process to properly look at soils uh, in their holistic way, in their full and complete way, to say, OK, there are chemical processes in the soil, there are biological processes in the soil, and they exist within a physical environment, within the structure, within the aggregates of the soil itself. And so we approach this, uh, we are now approaching this more complete and a whole way to, to view soils. Now, and that's soil health. It's a balance between all three of those things. But even then, this idea of biological farming, I mean, biological farming is suggesting biology, and that suggests, uh, well, plants, we know, they're biology, microbes, they're biology, and photosynthesis. It's a biological process. So actually, I think everyone is a biological farmer. We're all biological farmers. Photosynthesis is a biological process. 
And what a simple and beautiful and elegant uh, equation that we can actually boil down into uh, an emoji for you all. Um, it's, it's just so simple. Okay, there's devil in the detail, as always, but it's, it's energy, it's sunlight, it's carbon dioxide, it's air from the air, there's some water there. Okay, and then we have minerals, you know, and this is our piece of the puzzle, managing the minerals, the minerals which act as catalysts for photosynthesis, to drive photosynthesis, to drive plant production. Okay, I mean, it's actually, and from a practical, uh, from the field level point of view, you know, this is the space that we manage, you know, trying to monitor and manage the mineral catalyst to this process. Um, do you guys like the emoji, uh, the icon I chose for minerals here? Um, I, I figure you guys are farmers, right? You can handle the idea of some manure. Manure can represent um, minerals in this nice little equation. Although, that said, there is a fierce debate online as to whether that is in fact a poo emoji or an ice cream emoji. <laughs> I'm serious, there's a genuine debate online about this. Okay, so that's it. it, it we're all biological farmers. Photosynthesis is biological. Okay, and we just need to think and look about it in a more comprehensive way. And then we have this kind of, again, this emerging middle ground that seems to be happening in agriculture all over the world. You know, we've had the, uh, the old divide, the us and them, the organic and the conventional side, and that's been a real dominant kind of paradigm in, also in agriculture recently. And there's all sorts of interesting things now happening in the middle. There's all sorts of change. Now, conventional farmers, they're moving towards the middle. Again, what is the mainstream? You know, I'm seeing all sorts of uh, production systems using all sorts of interesting strategies and techniques now. It's very exciting, I think. There's some really fruitful things happening in the middle. And all these different types of farming now, production systems, okay, organic, biodynamic, permaculture, agroecology is definitely one that seems to be rising up the agenda. The carbon farming, this was a, kind of a hot thing in Australia, this idea of sequestering carbon in the soils, and that's kind of been superseded by regenerative agriculture now, of course, is the big buzzword, and that has a strong focus of sequestering carbon in the soils. Okay, biological soil health principles, that's a, that's a really big one over in North America, certainly. Sustainable ag, conservation ag, sustainable intensification, but that wasn't good enough. Then we had to have ecological intensification and restore the balance there with ecology. Climate smart agriculture, conventional, I mean, the list goes on and on. And in a way, I think that's kind of a good thing. It suggests that you know, we're not getting pigeonholed into how things were always done. We're beginning to explore new ideas, uh, find new strategies and techniques. And I think that's a really a good sign, a good thing that's happening in the, in the world of agriculture at the moment. But of course, we can all agree, often polarised views are sometimes lead to dead end, to, to lock in. You know, we, we, it's sometimes hard to, to make fruitful progress when we lock ourselves into sometimes very polarised views. And I think, for me, I really like this image. It kind of represents perhaps a, a, a better way to be thinking about agriculture, horticulture, farming, moving forward. It's the same, well, okay, there are these three kind of spheres, you know, what we might call the industrial uh, you know, method of agriculture, is this production focus, economies of scale, efficiencies. And of course, that's important. We have to produce, you know, we, we need to feed ourselves. We uh, need to earn some income. We need a production element to, to what we do, of course. And then, okay, perhaps we might say the agrarian, maybe organic, kind of sat more over here. There's a stronger sense of stewardship or community and these kinds of things. And, you know, and again, here I am saying that, well, conventional is moving into the middle. We can certainly see that organic is beginning to move in that way as well. We do have these very industrial style organic farms, which are simple simply you know, substituting inputs. You know, it's there, taking one input dependent model and just substituting it with organically approved inputs. It's still very an industrial style of farming and we're seeing these bigger, bigger kind of organic style farms also popping up now. So you know, it, it moves that way too. It's not, it's not just the other way. But the point is, again, that's just not a useful framing for me. I just think more important question is, how do I get the best? How do I make the most out of my production system whatever it is. And I think a really good way to frame that point is then to bring in ideas of ecology, uh, bringing in you know, the role of biodiversity, ecosystem services, the role of wildlife, beneficial insects, etc. And the point is, no matter what production system we use, 
the more we can bring in ecological principles, ideas of ecology, be that if we're over here, we're moving up here, or be that if we're over here, if we can move up towards ecology, it's a win-win. It doesn't really matter what our production system is, this is a good framing. How do we get the most, how do we integrate more ecology into the agricultural production system, more agroecology? So that's my kind of broad framing. My top 10 practices then, this is just according to me, in my opinion, uh, you won't find this necessarily in the, any, you know, the, the, bio, the Bible of biological farming. It's just my own thoughts and experiences on this. So we're going to whiz through uh, these 10 uh, present, um, ideas and uh, I'm going to just share you know, a concept, a slide, a bit of science on each of these and just some examples and, and that kind of thing. So, Designing with, we'll go through each one in detail, designing with diversity, feeding soil biology, managing our soil carbon, minimizing soil disturbances, remineralizing soils, but reducing some of our inputs at the same time, integrating our nutrient management and the use of foliar management, and, and all these really sit together, this five, six, seven, eight, they really sit together as strategies to help reduce inputs and the use of our inputs there, uh, bringing livestock back into the system, and okay, lastly, we need to be thinking the right way. And I'm, I'm going to talk about some systems thinking, the human element to, to farming. So, okay, a few examples. Let's go straight into principle one. And I put this first and foremost for a reason. I really think it belongs at the top of the list, designing with diversity, redesigning our production systems and integrating more diversity more ecology, we could also say, uh, in every possible way. And there are many different strategies to use here. It could be as simple as some intercropping. We can see this, okay, cover crops have really taken off. And, you know, we can see intercropping is just the next wave that will come after that. And it's this shift from, you know, away from monocultures. It's a shift from one, even a small step from one to two, you know, from a monoculture into a, a, an intercrop. <clears throat> That's an important first step towards more diversity. And I think there's a lot of really interesting things that I've seen in the world of intercropping all around the world at the moment, uh, which are very exciting. Lowered input costs, you know, lower disease and insect pressures, just simply by moving from one to two, you know, from mono to the beginnings of a, of a polyculture. I think there's lots of really exciting stuff happening there. But okay, it could be covers, these short bursts of intense diversity, same with green manures, more diversity in the pastures, so moving to herbal lays and more herbs and legumes and things in those pastures. I mean, it could even be agroforestry, you know, particularly more in the tropics, we're seeing that, that a bit more active. Silver pasture, bringing animals into that too. And perhaps our field margins, headlands and things, you know, being, being used for wildlife, for shelter belts, beetle banks, these kinds of things. Yeah. Lots of really great ways to bring diversity into the picture. And, you know, in a way, a, a picture says a thousand words. I mean, I almost don't need to explain. It's just, it's very, it's quite clear. We can just distinctly see the benefits here. We have, you know, diversity over here, different roots, different depths, different species, all accumulating different minerals from those different depths, different crop stages, different flowering times, encouraging different wildlife. I mean, we can see it's an eco, it's bringing these ecosystem services with more diversity. And, you know, this idea that we went down this path of monoculture, that, well, it was the most efficient. We want to minimize that competition. Uh, we want to improve our efficiencies. We want uniformity. This idea, I mean, I look at this half and I see more competition here than I do here. I mean, look at the volume of soil that these roots are exploring. It's the same volume of soil. They're all exploring the same volume of soil, competing for that volume of soil. Wow, they're all at the same crop stage. Ah, they have different nutrient requirements through different crop stages. So now all of these root systems are also competing for the exact same nutrients at the exact same time. Well, that sounds like more competition to me. Of course, well, then they're flowering all at the same time. And from an ecology or biodiversity point of view, well, that's great when they're on and they are flowering. There's, we will often see many insects come in, of course. Uh, what about now when they're not quite flowering? There's no food for the pollinators and whatnot. You know, so I think it's just the shift of how we think about these things. I kind of see more competition uh, there, I have to say. And I think the point about more diversity, this is a really nice example. It's not too clear on the slide, but this is looking at three different plants and immersing them into a growing gel, uh, which has a pH-sensitive um, uh, compound in there. 
So they were immersed into this growing gel just for six hours. And we can see that in that six hours, they started to change the rhizospheres around those root systems to change the pH here. And so over here, we have faba beans, just your kind of standard beans. And you can see that their root exudates are very acidic. They're driving, pushing the pH around that rhizosphere down. And this is why, sure, a lot of our legumes grow well in good, good alkaline soils, etc. And well, this is soybeans in the middle, just an example, and it's not too clear here, but you, roughly their rhizosphere is you know, somewhere around here-ish. Uh, it's a bit mixed there, you can kind of see. And over here we have maize. Uh, and you can see that their root exudates are driving more towards the neutral. So you know, different plants are creating the environment around their roots that they require. Uh, and of course, this rhizosphere pH has nothing to do with your bulk soil pH and the pH we look at on our soil test. This is happening in that one millimeter, two millimeters around the root systems. But the point is, here we have this highly acidic rhizosphere, so all of the trace minerals have become highly available under those more acidic conditions. And over here we have more neutral, so okay, molybdenum is becoming highly available, calcium becoming much more available. And so, of course, the plant is doing that to steer it for its own benefit, but if we were to bring some faba beans and some beans and some maize together, a legume and a cereal together, wow, no, now their root systems are overlapping, growing into each other's. And now the maize over here can get all these trace minerals that are highly available here. And now the legume can get some moly and some calcium that's much more available over here. So they're, they're, we, we then build in more resilience through this more diversity. They really help to support each other. There's a real synergy to be had there with more diversity. And okay, on a practical level, it could be cover crops. You know, bursts of intense diversity for that uh, point in the rotation, be that after a crop. You know, that's excellent. It could be an intercropping style or a relay crop cropping style. Here we have some uh, clover undersown, uh, a nice cereal here. Uh, <clears throat> and you can, you know, as we go through and harvest that, you know, there we have the green uh, cover already ready on the soil. Those leaf surfaces capturing sunlight, photosynthesizing and pumping those sugars and things down into the soil. You know, that's a nice example. Or even in our pastures, uh, going to more diversity. Here we have 12 species on this half. Here we have 18 species. Uh, wow, more diverse, uh, more competition over here, right? Shouldn't it be? There's more, more species, but well, actually we can see there's a real synergy that's happening there. And, okay, some nice herbs and plantains and things good for the livestock health and immunity as well. So, you know, I think diversity, it has to be at the center of our redesigning of our agricultural systems going forward. So that moves us into point two. Well, our strategy two, we should be feeding the soil biology always. Always have a living root as long as possible, as often as possible in that soil because those plants are pumping those root exudates down to feed those organisms. And all I really want to say is this, that certainly we're now, we are seeing that microbes' favorite food source in the soil is root exudates. That's what they love to feed on more than anything else. And of course, yeah, compost and manures and green manures, they're all important and they all play a role, uh, but the root exudates seem to be the preferred food source. And I'm gonna give a few examples of that in, in a few slides time. So the point is though that plants photosynthesize, they capture that sunlight, they breathe in carbon dioxide, and they will send a percentage of that carbon down to the roots and exude it out. And the numbers are quite significant. So in a more annual plant, a lot of annual plants, cereals say for example, they release around 20, around to 30% of the total carbon that they breathe in, they will pump that down to feed those organisms. And as we move to perennials, uh, grasses, for example, more perennial plants, well, the numbers creep up. It's 30 up to even 50% of the total carbon that that plant is breathing in. It pumps down to feed those organisms. And, you know, those are significant numbers. And I think for me, that's a sign that we really should be paying more attention to that uh, and understanding those interactions. Now, uh, I'm guilty of it, everyone is. We use this word to say, wow, yeah, and, pl and plants release these sugars and carbohydrates, foods to feed the organisms. That's true, but uh, in fact, they also release hundreds of other root exudates, which aren't necessarily food sources for the biology, but they are regulators, controllers. They are on-off switches. So plants also release these very unique phyto compounds, plant compounds, that act as switches to turn certain microbes on, to turn certain microbes off. 
So the plant is recruiting microorganisms through various crop stages, through vari various stresses, uh, different stresses. If they're attacked by a pathogen or an insect, they will release different compounds. Point is, you know, I'm not asking you all to study all these words. I can't pronounce half of them myself. But the point is to say there is a huge diversity of all of these different types of rutexidates that we are only just beginning to categorize, to classify, and understand what their impact is on that soil microbiome. And this is this point about, you know, as our understanding now of soil biology is increasing, as we are filling in the gaps, we can now look at soils a bit more holistically, a bit more complete. And this is, the, this is a real hot spot of scientific research at the moment, is understanding this interaction between plants, root exudates, and the soil microbiome, and the role of these root exudates in driving changes in the microbiome and changes in plant growth, etc. So it's a very interesting kind of hot spot. And this is his point. We know that they are recruiting microorganisms. They will, plants will release di different root exudates at particular crop stages or stresses, as I mentioned, and that encourages and wakes up certain um, sp specific species to then grow around that plant, to colonize that root system. But as that plant moves on, different growth stages, etc., well, then it starts to release some different chemical signatures, these signaling molecules, these root exudates, to wake up different groups of microorganisms in the soil. So it is recruiting all of the time, and it is photosynthesis that drives this process of root exudation. And that is the favorite and preferred food source for those microorganisms. So if you would like to feed your soil biology, we've got to keep that soil covered with living plants. So then thinking about, we all understand the benefits of organic matter and that it's important to build soil organic carbon. We all, I'm not going to delve into the whys of that. It's a, you know, I think we've discussed that kind of a topic enough. I just would like to bring a, a context here which, in terms of how we manage soil carbon. We can either think about that we can apply it, we can grow it, we certainly have to protect it, and then do all of that within the context of designing systems to help us sequester carbon. So, okay, what am I applying carbon? I mean, it does what it says on the tin. It's simply taking carbon from one source and putting it into the soil. So, okay, it could be compost, it could be manures, biosolids, anaerobic digestates, biochars, mulch, biostimulants, etc. All of these things that we can directly apply carbon to soil. And that's fine, that's good, that's a good strategy, it's a good overall soil health strategy. It's just that growing carbon, I think, through photosynthesis, uh, growing carbon is a much more uh, economical and uh, effective way to build carbon. I'm going to give an example of, of uh, some new science which is really suggesting this. So, okay, if we're growing carbon, it's about photosynthesis, it's about living roots. But of course, we can do that while we produce cash crops. Gr producing cash crops is growing carbon, releasing those root exudates, capturing those and sequestering them into the soil. But okay, it could be covers, it could be perennials, it could be agroforestry, the role of livestock, bringing more nitrogen fixation in. Hey, if we're going to grow carbon, we may as well grow nitrogen at the same time. Let's get some free nitrogen into the picture. And then using the biology, particularly fungi, to capture those root exudates and transform them and stabilize them into uh, soil organic pools. But we have to protect carbon. There's no point in sequestering and building carbon if we're just going to keep on uh, using practices that uh, volatilize it off, that oxidize carbon off, back off into the atmosphere. So there are strategies like no bare soil, you know, keeping the soil covered, that helps to hold carbon in the soil. Uh, minimizing our tillage, uh, you know, when we, just, when we disturb the soil, we break apart those aggregates, uh, leading to more loss of carbon. So minimizing tillage where possible. And that helps to improve structure, aggregation. But okay, we may need some disturbance at some points in time. It's about using the right tool at the right time, uh, you know, shallow as possible. You know, trying to minimize our disturbance is a, a broad, good strategy. And I, I will come back and talk about that. I know that one's a hot topic too. But okay, and I've really touched on this. There's a lot of these things begin to overlap, you see. So well, when we redesign our systems, that actually helps us also build more carbon in the soils through better system design. So again, we know more polyculture, more diversity helps from that point of view, uh, bringing livestock back into the picture. Okay, trees, as I mentioned again. Uh, I'm gonna talk about integrated nutrient management in a few slides, but also maybe choosing the right varieties, like designing varieties for production systems. Here we have einkorn and more of an ancient variety of wheat versus a modern wheat, grown, sown on the same day, same growing conditions, 
very, very different routing. So we can design our production systems for these expression of these traits and things that we want. And of course, we've been with our plant breeding for the last 50 odd years, we've been very focused on above ground, selecting for above ground traits. Well, we can also be selecting for a root Root, better, bigger root systems, more resilience, more drought proofing, more uh, mineral accumulators. All of these things can help us use less inputs and manage more sustainably. And I wanted to share a, a, a new piece of science here, which I think is one of the really um, important pieces that's only just come out a few months ago, that is the beginnings of this emerging idea of this important role of root exudates and how important they specifically are in, yes, talking to microbes and feeding microbes, but also building soil carbon. As I said, there's a lot of uh, hot kind of research happening in this space at the moment. And this is just one piece of evidence that really suggests that those root exudates are the most important thing for building soil carbon. It's not to say that our composts and litters are not play a role, but that root exudates specifically are particularly important. And I'll just read this out. Recent theory suggests that living root inputs, that means root exudates, they use the word living root inputs, exert a disproportionate influence uh, on soil organic carbon formation, but few studies have explicitly tested this by separately tracking root exudates versus litter inputs as they move through the soil food web and through the pool carbon pools. And that's that point I was making. When those root exudates are exuded, sometimes, I mean, how long do they stay in the soil? How long do they last in the soil? Sometimes only half an hour, one hour, two hours before they're consumed by the organisms and they only migrate a millimeter, two millimeters away. They're very hard to study. Root exudates are quite hard to study for that reason. And anyway, the way the experiment was designed, I'm gonna show you this one on the next slide, we show that root exudates are two to 13 times more efficient than litter, than root or shoot litter, in forming both slow cycling carbon pools and fast cycling carbon pools. So they show that root exudates play a dominant role in long-term carbon building, but also short-term carbon cycling for, for biology and things. And this is just, it breaks it down very simply. It's a very simple experiment, but you can see it's very effective. In treatment one here, they grew the plants during the growing season. So of course we have root exudates, 30 odd percent of that carbon being exuded out into the rhizosphere during the growing season, we're pumping, pumping, pumping that down. And then at the end, the plants, it's during a post-death uh, and senescence here, they left the residue right there. So we had root exudates in the growing season, plus residue and litter left right there. In treatment two here, during the growing season, again, we have root exudates, root exudates, being pumped out, pumped out, pumped out, but then at the plant death, they removed the litter, the roots and shoots, and put them over here into treatment three. So here we have only root exudates and no litter at all, got put into treatment two, and over here we have just litter. There was no root exudates, there was no, nothing up here in the growing season. Very simply designed experiment. And what they showed, these three bars correspond to the three you just saw here. What they showed is that, okay, litter only, when we have that treatment three here, just litter, well, it actually contributed very little to the soil carbon building pools. It plays a role, there's a small bump there you can see, and litter plays an important role in terms of protecting the soil surface uh, from you know, rainfall and uh, uh, sun, 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 when you guys get some sunshine here, if the soil ever dries out, which it did this year. Um, so, you know, we have those benefits of litter and mulch layers, so I'm not taking away from those. But this evidence was saying, well, they didn't really contribute much to carbon pools. But where we did have living roots, those root exudates, in fact, they actually were the key player, a driver of carbon sequestration. Now, there was a slight anomaly where, here in the first one, where we had root exudates plus litter. We would have thought treatment A, first one, would have been the highest. We had root exudates plus litter, should be the highest, then root exudates, okay, then litter. So that didn't quite happen, although it's not a hugely statistically significant difference. You could say they're roughly the same, but there's a bit of a bump there you can see. And it was postulated that, well, okay, maybe the microbes had to use a little bit of carbon to break down that litter. They had to use up some root exudates to, to kind of break down that litter. So there was a little bit of a loss there. But either way, that's not the point. The, the point is that where we have root exudates, they were the key driver of building carbon. So this is you know, some new emerging kind of science helping us to rethink the role of root exudates and those microorganisms in all sorts of soil processes. 
So, okay, then in terms of uh, next strategy, minimizing soil disturbance. You know, this has to be a, a, a strategy that we can all embrace. And again, doesn't matter on our production system. You know, some of you may be no-till in the room. Uh, some of you may be tillage farmers. It really doesn't matter. It, when we use the wording, we all should help be working towards minimizing soil disturbance. Well, we can all get on board with that. Some of you can't go no-till. Some of you might be organic, for example, etc. Uh, fine, but you can still uh, work towards minimizing soil disturbance. What about that clover undersown with that cereal I showed earlier? You know, that clover was undersown, cereal was harvested, and then we moved into that next... That was an organic farm, I should say. And, you know, we moved into that next clover rotation without disturbing the soil. And this is where intercropping, undersowing, relay cropping, these kinds of things, here's the strategies where we can start to min uh, still produce and minimize soil disturbance. And the reason we want to minimise the soil disturbance is very clear. It's, it's all about protecting soil aggregates. And these are the things, I just talked about those root exudates and their role in building carbon. Well, that carbon then gets protected and stored in soil aggregates. This, this aggregate, of course, is a ball, a sphere. It is a three-dimensional structure. All of the carbon inside that aggregate is protected. But once we come through and disturb that soil, well, we break apart those aggregates and now all of that soil is highly exposed to oxygen where CO2 carbon can be lost as CO2. So it do, we've got to maintain aggregates uh, to maintain good carbon in our soil. And you know, this was a study that looked at a whole range of different uh, factors that influence soil aggregation. What is the driver of aggregation? How do we create good aggregated, good structured soils? And they looked at a whole range of different variables and found that the most important factor that influenced the aggregation of soil was the presence of mycorrhizal fungi, one of these, which I'm sure you've all heard of, beneficial fungi that form those root colonized plant root system, forming those beneficial associations. And they were the key factor. There was a strong correlation. The more aggregated your soil was, the more mycorrhizal fungi you had. Okay? They were tightly correlated. And so... They are the, which makes sense, they are the key driver. They release all these uh, sticky substances and their hyphae pulls particles together, helping to aggregate soil. And of course, cultivation then breaks these apart, as, I, as we just mentioned. And I think this is also the really important point. They found that fungicide applications reduced the presence of mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, we might expect that. We've applied a fungicide. We might expect that some of the fungi to be compromised by that. But they also found where the fungicide applications were taking place, there was also a reduction in these aggregates, which of course makes sense because we've, not, we've compromised the fungi who's the key driver of those aggregates. So when we remove them, we remove aggregates. So here is a, a, a real important point. That everything is absolutely connected. And how we are managing our foliage, the canopy up top on the plant, over time can start to lead to not good aggregation, poorly aggregated soils. And when we use heavy machinery and uh, do, do that a few times through the season, a few repeat on those uh, fungicides, well, over time we compact that soil. We lose those aggregates. It's those aggregates that help to maintain soil structure. So I think that's a really important point. Everything is connected. Uh, who would have thought our foliar applied chemistry can influence the soil's structure? It's an interesting point. Okay, um, next one is remineralization. Uh, all I'll say here is that, okay, the point about photosynthesis, this is the exact same slide as my emoji slide earlier. It's saying the exact same thing. Uh, we need sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and minerals acting as, uh, as part of enzymes or catalysts. Minerals which catalyze the process of photosynthesis and produce sugar, uh, glucose, that first product of photosynthesis. The point is the plant cannot do it if it does not have adequate supply or balance of the minerals. And that's our job as farmers to get this piece of the puzzle right, to get this yellow right. And then what does the plant do with that sugar, that simple little carbon source? Well, again, it requires minerals, which act as catalysts, to synthesize a whole range of more diverse and more complex carbon compounds. Everything that the plant is made up of, that it requires for growth processes, 
uh, it all comes back to, it all synthesizes those from that first little sugar molecule. But again, it requires minerals to catalyze this process to synthesize more complex sugars, complex carbohydrates, proteins, amino acids, fats and oils, hormones, vitamins, phytonutrients, protective compounds, uh, aromatic compounds, flavor compounds, um, pigments, colors, uh, defense chemicals, I mean, you name it, the list just goes on and on. Root exudates, everything that the plant is made up of and that it requires, it needs those mineral catalysts and that's our job. And it all comes from that simple molecule into complexity and diversity. I mean, even more staggering to think actually it all comes from thin air, actually, which is quite a remarkable thought to think that everything that the plant is comes from the air. Okay, and a little bit of minerals from the soil. That's our job right here. So the point is, yeah, we may need to remineralize the soils. If we don't have adequate supply of these minerals, well, this process cannot work, cannot flow. And it is your job as a farmer to be a photosynthesis manager and to drive this process. So we've got to look at the role of minerals there. And I think no bigger example can I uh, give than if we then link this point into the discussion of nitrogen, which of course is an important point. Nitrogen management, it's a really critical nutrient. But of course there's all this free nitrogen. We're so dependent on nitrogen from the bag. Uh, well, actually there's a vast amount already there, free, in the air. But we, okay, plants can't access it. But the bacteria can. And we're not talking just legumes here, we're talking free-living nitrogen fixes. We are now categorizing many, many bacterial species who live around the root systems of any plant, of grasses, of shrubs, of herbs, I mean anything, not just legumes, free-living nitrogen fixes who also have this capacity to deliver nitrogen to the plant. However, they need minerals too, those microbes need minerals too. Hey, we, we understand that plants need plant nutrition, humans need nutrition, animals need nutrition. Well, are we thinking about the, the requirements of microbes and minerals for microbes? Well, it turns out that they need certain trace minerals in order for them to deliver all this free nitrogen. We have huge potential to reduce our dependency on nitrogen from the bag if we can encourage more nitrogen fixation. But those bacteria require certain catalysts, as certain minerals acting as enzymes or catalysts in that process. Molybdenum, iron, nickel. Molybdenum and iron, let's start with them. They, they form, they're a metal, they're a mineral that forms this enzyme called nitrogenase. And what nitrogenase does is, is the, it is the enzyme that grabs onto that nitrogen gas in the air. Two nitrogens attached with a three strong bond and this unique enzyme can grab onto that nitrogen gas and pull it apart. Then we have this other enzyme here called hydrogenase, and nickel is particularly important for this, but you can also get an iron hydrogenase as well, but nickel is particularly important for nitrogen fixation. And what does hydrogenase do? Well, it splits apart hydrogen, hydrogen gas H2. So now we have some free hydrogen and some free nitrogen, and now we can bring those two together to deliver ammonia to the plant. And this is what the bacteria do. But they require moly, iron or nickel. How many of us are, I bet many of you are watching, managing your iron. How many of us are managing our molly and our nickel? How many of us also know that nickel is an essential plant nutrient? It is essential for plant growth. It's part of another enzyme in the plant called urease, which helps to break apart urea and utilize urea. So if you are a conventional farmer using urea fertilizer, you need nickel to utilize that urea. We don't think about these things enough. And this is the point. You may not need to apply these trace minerals. Maybe you have enough already. But they play a really important role. Maybe we should be looking at them a bit deeper. Okay, then these for legumes. This is true of all nitrogen fixes. And then we have the legume-specific ones too. Cobalt has a role in nodule uh, formation. Boron, calcium. They're really important for nitrogen fixation. So if we want free stuff, we should be thinking about all of these other nitrogen synergists to go with. And moving on, that links us to, well, consequently, there's lots of free stuff out there to use. Let's try and start dialing down our dependency on those artificial inputs. And with good reason, we're incredibly efficient at being inefficient with nutrients from the bag. How much actually gets taken up by the plant? Well, nitrogen, 40, 50 odd percent of applied nitrogen 
uh, artificial nitrogen reaches the plant, is taken up by the plant. The other 50% can be, could be leached, could be volatilized, could be locked up. Uh, it's very inefficient. How many of us would like to use 50% less uh, fertilizer as a, good, as a first step? You know, then we can dial down further from there. Okay, what about phosphorus? 10 to 20% of what is applied actually gets into the plant. Okay, phosphorus, we don't lose so much, it more so gets locked up and becomes unavailable. Okay, potassium, 40 odd percent. These are rough numbers, okay? It's going to be different in different soil types and different climates, but you know, broadly the consensus is the numbers are around this ballpark. Okay, so if that's what we're getting into the plant, how much are we losing from the system? You know, and the point is there's a lot of inefficiencies, there's a lot of potential to dial down our inputs uh, and improve our input uh, efficiencies. And part of that strategy is also understanding that soils do indeed have a, a bank of minerals, a reserve of minerals present in them that we often don't access. And that's this total pool, this often you know, insoluble and unavailable locked up pool of nutrients that exists in the soil, but we are there, but we just simply don't utilize them. We're not cycling them, we're not accessing them. And we need particularly biology to help us access those. So the point is that there's, soils do have a big reserve and it can be tenfold, twentyfold higher than what you normally look at on your soil test when we look at the available forms there can be tenfold more there, but just not yet available. And so there's scope to remineralize. We've got to strike this balance. Yes, we need to remineralize and bring key things that we may not have into the picture, but we have lots of opportunities to dial down to improve efficiencies. And one of the ways we can do that is through integrated nutrient management, my next point. And integrated nutrient management is simply about integrating as many different strategies together to manage fertility. Why be dependent on just one or the other? You know, let's bring them all together. They all have different benefits, different strengths, different weaknesses. And that's what's good about integrated nutrient management. So, okay, it's broadly about, often it will be about combining organic-based inputs with inorganic-based inputs and trying to bring together a middle ground of, of those two strategies. But, okay, it could be other strategies too, managing crop residues, biosolids, composts, manures, okay, increasing nitrogen fixation, maybe with more legumes, maybe with better management of trace minerals. Uh, it could be the role of biofertilizers or microbial inoculants there. Uh, it, it could also be the role of animals in reintegrating into the system. And the point is that, and this slide summarizes it nicely, what the strategy of integrated nutrient management is all about. It's simply saying, well, rather than apply nutrients in a highly soluble form on their own, well, actually, we'd be better to combine them with some kind of a carbon source to, to, to complex, to wrap up, to chelate, to, to bind to that nutrient. And when we wrap up and bind that nutrient with a carbon source, well, like you can see over here, we complex that together, we stabilize that nutrient. It's when that nutrient is applied uh, in a soluble, water-soluble form on its own, well, that's where it can, of course, very quickly leach away. It can lock up, it can volatilize off. But if we complex it and bind it to some carbon first, well, then we stabilize it. It's not going to be so leachable. Now, we don't have a single ion in the soil, we have a molecule, we have a structure here which is, we can not leach so easily. Uh, this nutrient will not lock up with other minerals now. It's, it's, it's stabilized. So it's, a, it's an important strategy, and, and the idea of integrating our nutrient management strategies together with a carbon base is, is one of those key tips. Okay, moving on to the very final few now, uh, foliar management. I put this one in here. I know a lot, perhaps a lot of people don't even do foliars or don't own a foliar rig. Many of you will, some of you won't, but... I put it in here because I think it is a really important piece of the puzzle in which we can help us improve our nutrient use efficiencies and dial down those inputs. I think it has a role to play in that space. And the point is that that is because, well, plants, they are an expression of the soil health, you know, of the, plant, of the soil's physical chemistry and biology, all of those interactions drive nutrient uptake and the plant takes that up from the soil. So in a way the plant is an indicator of soil health. Its growth is an expression of the soil's chemistry, physics and biology. And so it's an important piece of that puzzle. But however, of course as we just discussed, through photosynthesis and through those root exudates that come down and exude out into the soil, 
Well, the plant also influences the soil processes as well. It's not just that the plant is an expression of the soil, the plant also changes the soil through those root exudates. It's also changing the biology, the chemistry, the physics. So it is a two-way street, it is an interaction. And so I think tools to measure plant health should become important. We should put them into the focus. So it could be tissue tests, sap tests, visual assessments of plant health. That can give us a guideline, an indicator of soil function. M keeping in mind that those minerals are catalysts for that photosynthetic process. And therefore we can use foliar applied nutrients as targeted, highly efficient, small doses, targeted applications of minerals to, for the plant to take up to prime that photosynthetic process. And that's where foliars can be highly efficient there. And the plant will take up those uh, minerals from the foliar. It primes photosynthesis. And when we prime photosynthesis, we, 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 we help the plant produce more root exudates, which then help to drive much more nutrient cycling down in the soil. So it's just a primer, a little bit of primer on the foliar, which then helps to drive much more nutrient cycling down in that soil, amongst that soil microbiome. So really, these are interconnected, and soil health is equal to plant health. Plant health is equal to soil health. There's no soils without plants, no plants without soils. They are one and the same thing. Why do we disconnect them? Why do we manage soils and manage plants? We should be managing them together. And so my point here is that it's not just about chemistry, physics, and biology. It is this three parts, yes, but how we really should be thinking about soil health is like this, is the four part. We have to insert plants into that picture of chemistry, physics, and biology. They are influenced by that, but they also influence the soil as well. So this is a much more useful way to think and frame so the concept of soil health. It should be a four-part Venn diagram. I like my Venn diagrams, uh, I have to say. But uh, the other reason I think that foliar management is going to be a more, become more important moving forward is this whole emerging understanding of the plant's immune system and that we can apply certain triggers and, and substances or microbes and compounds that can turn on the plant's immune system to help it fight off disease, to help it fight off path uh, pathogens and, and insects, etc. And this is, again, one of these new, really emerging kind of hot spaces of, of a lot of scientific endeavour at the moment, understanding these immune responses. When plants get attacked by a pathogen or an insect, they send all these, they recruit microbes, microbial recruitment, they send all these stress on-off switches, those root exudates, to wake up certain microbes to help them fight off that insect or fight off that disease. There's this whole plant microbe communication happening through those root exudates. And we now are beginning to understand that that has important impacts on plant immunity, on, plant on health, plant health, plant stress. And so I think some of these things like biofertilizers or biostimulants, botanicals, you know, it's about tapping into the microbiome, really, of the soil and the microbiome all over the plant, the phytobiome, and understanding these interactions. And that's going to be more important moving forward, helping us to, again, use better integrated pest management strategies, dialing down our dependency on pesticides using other novel techniques such as this. And again, at the end of the day, though, it also comes back to good mineral management. You know, this is the same process. It's photosynthesis again, the minerals acting as catalysts to synthesize immune defense chemicals, uh, antifeedants, antihibivory, bitter compounds, cell strengtheners, deterrent compounds, volatile compounds, all of these things that help to deter or suppress our insect pests. But again, it's about good mineral management and optimizing this so that it can catalyze that process. And it's the same for disease resistance as well. It's, it all comes from this, it all comes from this. It's your piece of the puzzle here, optimizing nutrient balance and nutrient availability of all of the macros and all of the micros in order to drive these immune processes, antimicrobials, antibiotics, physical compound, physical barriers, cell strengtheners, these kinds of things, these immune compounds that we can fire up with the plant. So we, again, we couple these two things together, or these three things together. We couple good mineral management, some of these inducing, priming agents, and the microbiome, good soil health around that root system. We bring these three pieces of the puzzle together, we've got real potential for optimizing plant health minimizing our dependency on uh, uh, pesticides and some of those uh, inputs which are of course somewhat controversial uh, these days.
Okay, so then we're moving to, I've got just two pictures to, to, to wrap this up. Uh, I won't say too much on livestock integration. I just think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's about increasing the, bringing more ecology in, increasing the biodiversity. So, you know, of course, animals bring with them a different ecology. Um, there are different species here, more diverse. Uh, those manures, the insects that live in the manure, cowpats. I mean, they're bringing a new ecosystem, a, a new piece of ecology into the arable, into the horticulture, it doesn't matter, both, you know, into the production system. So I think they have a good good sense in that regard, and more diversity. But of course, this is real soil improvement. Here we have perennials, those grasses. They're pumping 50% of that carbon they breathe in down to the soil. Not 20, not 30%, but more like 50%, pumping that carbon down, improving the soil health. So I think you know the role of, uh, sure, permanent grasslands, but certainly some of our uh, rotational lays and these herbal lays, these things that are becoming popular, rightly so, more diversity, in rotation, also helping us uh, with our production cycles through the rest of that rotation, building up fertility with animals and then using it within the rest of the rotation. It makes good sense in my opinion. So I think if we can bring livestock back, or if you're just a livestock farmer, maybe you need to be bringing some uh, vegetables or some cereals back into your rotation, for example. And then my last point is this idea of systems thinking, and I have a dual meaning to this word. Systems thinking, we could also say, is much akin to holistic management. It's about looking at the bigger picture, the, the system. It's about widening the view on, on soil health and soil and plant health and saying, well, you know, it's not so simplistic. Let's not boil it down and simplify. Uh, let's em embrace that complexity. We need to look at the entirety of the system, and when we do that, we can make better decisions. It is about redesigning the system and it's about identifying leverage points, you know, focal points, points where you can get, uh, focus your time, your money, your energy, you know, focus your practices to get the biggest bang from your buck. You know, we're looking for multiple outcomes, multiple benefits, points of action where you invest your time and effort where you get multiple benefits. And that's what systems thinking is all about. It's about looking at the full picture and identifying where the critical points are for you to focus your time, effort, money, energy, etc. But I have a double meaning to this, so that's, that's, that's holistic management. Let's, let's try and measure the whole, manage the whole thing. But I have a double meaning to this one, and that's the, the hand there. This is also the human touch. Uh, there's also the, cult, the social, cultural, uh, economic, political interactions that feed into all of, of agriculture, all of those my former points on that list. And I think we need to bring more social, cultural interactions. It's not just about soils and plants and animals. It's about being here. It's about being here today. One of the most important things is not, your, not the compaction out there in the fields, it's the compaction up here. Uh, this is the bigger one compaction we have to deal with, and the way in which we do that is to coming along to events like today. It's so important to, to have a community, to have that social cultural link, to know that there's others out there doing the same as you, trialing some of these things, using some practices, learning from others, knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer, etc. The social cultural element is also so important and we should do that within the context of systems thinking and designing farming systems for better outcomes. That has to be a piece of biological farming in my opinion as well and any farming, of course. So, uh, really, it comes down to this. You know, it's, it is agronomy, it's also biology, it's also ecology. Okay? And there's my 10 strategies. Let's design with diversity and put that systemically central to our production systems, feed that soil biology, manage soil carbon, particularly with living roots and root exudates, uh, minimize our soil disturbance, Okay, disturbances, it's not just cultivation. I mean, you know, uh, overgrazing is a disturbance, compaction, machinery compaction is a disturbance, too much fertilizer is a disturbance. There's lots of soil disturbances, but okay, I talked about physical disturbance there. Remineralize where necessary, but do that at the same time as dialing down some of those other inputs. We can do that with integrated nutrient management and foliar efficiencies, bringing livestock back in and some of our systems thinking. So I'll leave you with these two images. This is my take home message for today. Yes, we want to design. Yes, we need this bigger picture, a social, cultural, uh, holistic kind of point, a landscape point of view, a human dimension. All of that has to come in. 
and we do that at the same time as bringing more ecology into our production systems, no matter what production systems we use. Let's not, let's not bash heads and have a fight over that. Let's just say, how do we get the best out of my production system, no matter what? And the answer to that is absolutely integrating more ecology into your system, be you organic, conventional, regenerative, this, that, or the other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that's my take-home message is more ecology, uh, more systems thinking, more des intentional design. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or website there if you'd like some more information. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much, George.